Welcome to the Victory Hour here at Grove Avenue Baptist Church. For today's service, we're gonna focus on the beauty of Jesus, his atoning death, his glorious resurrection. This will be a service entitled, It Is All About Jesus. As we do that, we get to admire our beautiful background that points us and reminds us of how wonderful he is. Please stay and join us here live on the Victory Hour. this morning. Amen. Amen. Lost on
you sing this to Jesus, sing it all to the Lord right now. Let me sing it together. Let's do it. You may be seated. Good morning, Grove Avenue Baptist Church. It's great to be with you this morning. And for those of you that are visiting with us and that we're able to bring church to you, we are so glad that you're part of our church family. I know that you have sensed that this is a place, you know this is a place that exalts the name of the Lord Jesus. You are part of our family, and we're so glad that you're there worshiping the Lord Jesus with you. Many of you have checked us out via this camera, and now you have seen and come into this place and visited. I met someone who had come by and checked us out personally today, and that was really neat. And uh, we love, we know you're scoping us out, but save some time. Just come. It's going to be great. We'll just hug your net, eat some donuts, and it'll be wonderful. We're so glad that you're here, and I know that you know that this is a church that trusts the Lord, that exalts Him, and leans on Him for all things. Amen? Amen. Do you believe that this is, we serve a God who can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask or think? Amen? Amen. We have devoted this year to focusing on Christ and living per his example. We have not shied away from praying to him and asking great things and big things from him, specific things. He has parted the waters in the past. He has created the world in the past. And so we have prayed very specific things in our ministry. In a moment, we're preparing to give, and it's a ministry that I've even asked many people to consider with me joining and giving over and above what we might have committed at the beginning of the year because God is doing something here. If he answers our very specific prayers, if he answers our prayers, we better be ready because the Lord can do it and do miracles and do it again. How many of you believe that the Lord can do miracles over and above what you ask or think? Yes. Then you'll want to be here next Sunday because I have a very, very specific prayer request answered. I have asked the Lord for some incredibly incredibly grandiose and specific requests and he has once again parted the waters and delivered next service i will take 15 to 20 minutes and present to you a very very exciting development with regard to our student ministries i can't even help containing my excitement by the way there's a few of us that know. By the way, you can ask Sherry. Try and get it out of her bribe or do whatever you want. All of our staff, we are locked down like Fort Knox. So <laughs> unmarked bills under the door, I guess. We'll, we'll do something. I'm telling you, those of us that have gone through this whole process and discussions and elaborations, we are just bursting. This is the worst torture to be having to wait for seven days to present this. But you don't miss next week as we just praise the Lord just praise the Lord for what he's done months earlier than what we ever thought. Ephesians 3.20 says he can do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power that works in us, and he has. And that's a ministry that I'm supporting and I want to support, and I hope you join me too. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your blessings. We are excited about what you are doing in this place. So, Lord, take these offerings, and Lord, so that, that we'll be prepared for more ministry opportunities should you, should you show up earlier than our agenda. Lord, we give in order to be ready. Thank you so much for your blessings. We give 
through the church to you so your gospel can be spread. We love you. We praise you this day. In Jesus' precious name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
Lord, you are holy. Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Oh God, we praise your name. You are so worthy of praise. Lord, how good it is. How good it is to be with other believers. And just lift up the name of Jesus. You have done so much in our lives. So worthy of your praise. Lord, should you not have done anything for us, we praise you for who you are. You're the Savior of our souls. Oh, Lord, you are holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. God, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, how good it is to praise the name of the Lord. Take your word today, Lord. Put it on our hearts exactly where it needs to go. As this is a day, we're going to entirely focus on Jesus. I pray that my speech and preaching this morning be not of enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that our faith would not stand in the wisdom of a man, but rest in the power of God. We lift you up, Jesus. Jesus. What a beautiful name. We love you in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. What a wonderful time of worship. And thank you so much. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 2. If you have your phones, go ahead and pull up Philippians chapter 2. Today is a very exciting day. For today and next week, the next two Sundays, we are going to do nothing but praise the name of Jesus. Amen. It's not an insertion. It's not a change of course. It is what is at the heart of this ministry for decades and decades. At the beginning of the year, we started with the sermon series, as you well know. It's a new day at Grove Ave. We talked about the characteristics of unity, humility, and selflessness that will forever characterize our ministry. We have met new people. We have tried new things. Things have been slightly different and yet exciting at the same time. It's a new day, and it's an exciting day. But I want to spend the next two weeks just simply reminding everyone in this house, everyone that ever watches us on TV, anyone that knows the reputation of this church, anyone where this is going in social media, literally around the world, internationally, we learned this week, anyone that listens to this ministry will know that even though it is a new day, there will be some things that never, ever, ever, ever change, and that is it is always about Jesus. At Grove Avenue, it will always, always be about Jesus. Nothing will change. That is, that is how the Lord came to earth and started his church. That is how the believers always made it. That's how they were sustained in this church. It will be no different. We're not about to change course anytime soon. In this place, no matter what we do, no matter what changes come, no matter what happens, we will always be rooted and grounded in the fact that everything we say, do, or think, every action, every program, every leader, every individual, everything will always be making about a big deal about Jesus Christ. It will always be about Jesus. And the moment someone were to suggest it's not about Jesus, then someone's leaving. It's either me or you, and trust me, I'm not going anywhere. So <laughs> it's all about Jesus, because that's, that's our hope. It's all about Jesus. Oh, goodness. I'm, today's message is one of the most beautiful passages about the person of Jesus. And it just so happens to come right on the heels of the passage we have been studying for the last 30 days. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 says, Let this mind of unity, humility, and selflessness be in you. And we stop there. And that's where we ended with communion last week. It's today we're going to finish the verse. Because unity, humility, and selflessness was also lived out in the example of our precious Lord Jesus. It's his example we follow. The reason why we live in unity, humility, and selflessness is because our great Lord, the head of the body of the church, lived his life in unity, humility, and selflessness. So now I'd like to take you from where we stopped last week and take you on and look at the life of Jesus. 
a beautiful, beautiful passage. And I want to encourage you, there's, there's, there's three types of people listening in and, and maybe attending here. And, and I want to prepare you for the study we're about to do. Because this is a very detailed and very complex portion of scriptures. Many pastors would rather maybe back off this passage because they feel that maybe it should be reserved for a deep Bible study with a small group of veteran believers. Uh, some reserve these for theology books and they say it's just very complex. But, but I think truth is beautiful and I think if we approach it in the right way, I think there are some people that that are new in Christ, that can swallow these deep theological pills and maybe not even know they did. I think truth stretches, truth should convict, and so I'm not going to avoid approaching a very complex passage because it is so beautiful. So if you're one of three people, either you're a seasoned believer here, you're familiar with this passage, I hope like me, you've learned something new today, you will be stretched a little bit and encouraged to further engross yourself in studying about Jesus Christ. If you're a new believer, some of these concepts may seem like way kind of over your head, but that's okay. Just like when we work out, it's good to be stretched. If we stayed within our same regimen, we would always stay at that level of strength. So just like an exercise, it's good to stretch ourselves. Now, you know the days when you exercise and you decide to add on more weight, the very next morning, it hurts. So hopefully I don't hurt your brain here, but it's good to exercise and go, you know what the Bible I thought was deep, but it's vivid and the depths of it are expound. So think of it like a rubber band. Today, we're going to stretch it out, bring it back, stretch it out, and you'll find you'll have more capacity. So I, I hope you get a little stretched, but don't worry if you miss some of these concepts. That's fine. Stretch yourself in your faith. That's how we grow. And if you're a new a person in Christ that is listening in, considering the things of Christ. I want you to walk away with this notion that the Christian faith is logical, reasonable. It's very easily to be explained. It, it is complex, and it's not just blind faith. The Christian faith is actually grounded in a historical person with very logical rationale. And I hope that today you would be convinced to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I mean that with all sincerity. So wherever you are, put yourself in each camp, put the expectation on you as we talk about this beautiful passage of Scripture. This passage of Scripture is attempting to describe how God wrapped himself in flesh, came onto the earth, and what that looked like. Very complex. So let me take you through the portion we're going to read. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, which was also in Christ Jesus... And look at verse 2. Uh, let, me, let me push pause it and, and let me share with you about Bible study. Let me, I didn't want to escape this principle. In Scripture, there are two kinds of writing, so to speak. There are writings that tell you, do this, like a prescription from a doctor. So there are what's called prescriptive portions. We spent the last four or five weeks studying a very prescriptive portion of Scripture. Verse 2, verse 3, verse 4. Be unified, humble, selfless. Do this, do this, do this. Don't do this, do this. Very prescriptive. And then in Scripture, there are examples. They have people that live out that teaching and exemplify it. So we're not, we're to approach the prescriptions portions of the scripture and say, I must do that, 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 that. But when we get an example of somebody that lived that out in their own unique life, we're to read their example, not to do that, 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 but to be inspired by their example. Because if you try to do everything they do, that's their only unique life situation. We're going to talk about how Jesus lived in unity, humility, selflessness, and trust me, there's things he did that we cannot do. He was God. In fact, if we claim to be God, we're sinning. So we're not looking to do everything we did. We're to be inspired by his example. He lived out unity, humility, and selflessness. So I want you to, we're going to approach this example today, and we're to walk away inspired to live it out in our own unique life. So hopefully that makes sense. Unity, humility, and selflessness was prescribed these last few weeks. Now Paul lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ and says, now watch his example and be inspired by how he lived out those prescriptions. He, he practiced what he preached. 
and you're to walk away being inspired that the head of the church lived it, so so should we. The reason why we studied last month unity, humility, and selflessness is because our great leader did. So we're going to look at his example. So watch for unity, humility, and selflessness in his life. Verse 6, unity exemplified. Who, Jesus, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God. You'll learn that that's a description of unity as an example lived out. We'll cover that in a moment. Verse 7, humility exemplified. Here's how the Lord lived a humble life. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Jesus lived the example of humility, which should inspire us to live humility in our lives, in our own unique situations. Verse 8, at the end, selflessness exemplified. And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is how Jesus lived a life of unity, humility, selflessness, will be inspired by his example. So, unity exemplified. Um, this verse, in verse 6, is very confusing in many translations, very complex. And so I, I want to encourage you, the reason why it's so complex in these three verses is because the example that Paul lifts up here just so happens to have a very complex life. Oh, by the way, if you read Philippians 2, he lifts up three other people who live by unity, humility, selflessness. Timothy, Epaphroditus, and Paul. Their situations are very simple. They're human. But this is the God-man. So that's why it's so complex to understand. So don't get lost in the details. It has to be complex because his example is very complex. But get right through all the complexity and see the unity in his own unique life situation. So here's how the Lord exemplified unity. So hold your breath. We're going down but we're going to unearth some beautiful treasure. Verse 6, Who, being in the form of God, consider it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 6, Who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Here's what this verse is saying. It's saying that when Jesus came onto this earth, he always never stopped being God and as a result, he didn't have to go and try to hold on to his deity or go find it and steal it. Translations are a lot different at this point. Um, here's what is happening in history. In Jesus' own unique life situation, never happened before, never will happen again, where the Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, determined let's create man in our image. And if you study scriptures closely, you learn that God the Father decreed the creation, but the second person of the Trinity, the Son, did it. And then, how appropriately, the very agent of creation, the one that did it, was the appropriate one to enter his own creation. John chapter 1 says that he... The Word became flesh and dwelt among His own creation. So when He came on this earth, the most amazing, colossal, cataclysmic event occurred where part of the Godhead wrapped Himself in His creation's form and dwelt on earth. The most profound, mind-boggling scenario where part of the Godhead came and entered their own creation as one of his creation, as a sinless creation that God had wrapped himself in flesh. This verse says this. I know it's a crazy scenario, but this verse says this. Even in that most colossal, cataclysmic, unbelievable, unthinkable, immeasurable scenario where part of the Godhead went to earth, the God had never, ever, ever separated and fractured their unity. Why? Because he was always being God when he was on this earth. That's why he didn't have to go say, Father, please give me my deity, or God, don't take it away from me. There's some belief systems that say right before he was on the cross that his deity left, or he got his deity at his baptism. No, from the moment 
prior to time existing, in all of God's existence, when he wrapped himself in flesh, and even now in eternity, he never ceased to continually, constantly be God himself. In the most cataclysmic, colossal, unbelievable scenario, the God had never fractured unity. You know what that means? You know what that means, church? That there is no cataclysmic event that could ever occur in this church. There is no colossal event that could ever shake us to where we ever have to fracture our unity. There is not one unthinkable scenario that we have to fear our unity fracturing in this church. There is not one event that could even come close to this example. That means no matter what comes our way, no matter what comes our way, there is no excuse for us not to remain unified because there's nothing like what the Godhead did. And they forever remained unified. Pretty deep, huh? We can come up for air, take a breath for a moment because we're going back down, get ready. God walked, God practiced what he preached. You'd say, well, that's very theoretical. No, think about this. Think if unity was fractured. By the way, you'd say, well, what if on the cross? He said, God, you know, why have you forsaken me? There was not a fracture of unity. If you look back at the psalm, that was a plea for, I can be honest with God. Taking the sin of the word, world hurt. In fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, my heart is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. My heart's killing me, literally, it translates. But he said, I will not stop going to the cross. Never fractured unity. And if we're to examine or exemplify the heart of God, then that means the more we live a unified life, no matter what the circumstances come, no matter what comes our way, no matter what test or trial comes our way, we can remain unified. Praise His name. That's how we glorify God. He lived a life of unity. He also lived a life of humility. Look at verse 7 and a little bit of verse 8. But... Notice that word. If you understand verse 6, that word is profound. Even though he was God, here we go, made himself of no reputation. Some translations say the words he emptied himself. We'll explain. Taking, notice that word, the form of a bondservant. Coming, notice that word, in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. This verse on humility is only as profound as how profoundly you understand and clearly you understand verse 6. He was God wrapped up in flesh and he was 100% God and 100% man 100% of the time without sin as he walked on this earth. And that God even though he was made himself of no reputation. Now this let's hold our breath here we go down take a deep dive. If you were to pull this up on your phones, as many do, and by the way, I know we have signs that say turn your cell phones off. I actually want them on um, because there's some apps that have 53 Bibles. I bring 53 Bibles, by the way, every time I come to church, BibleGateway.com. I get no revenue from that plug, by the way, but um, I love getting fact-checked immediately. I know when I say a Greek word, there's a couple of you that go down and go, wait, I'm going to check that out. Love it. Bring your phones. Just silence. Um, Unless you're of the medical profession. But the opinions expressed are not those of Grove Avenue Baptist Church. Just um, <laughs> You'll find in most translations it says, but he emptied himself. That is a literal translation. But you'll notice in the translation we're using, it says, but made himself of no reputation. All of that's coming from one Greek word. This is an interpretation of what the concept means. Emptied himself is the literal translation. Now you say, well, who's right, who's wrong? Don't, don't worry. Translators get, if you were translating, it, get, it gets really challenging because the word means kanao. It means to empty. And 21st century translators go, but wait a second. 2,100 years later, the word empty means to like get rid of. So do, do I help the reader understand what he's saying or do I just translate it and hope you have someone to explain it? But if you never do, you'll think that God like gave up his godness or something. So what do you do? You try to, do you say literal? Do you try to help? And that's why certain translations decide we'll just do it strict and you figure it out or we'll try and help you throughout. 
And so that's why you look for a Bible. When I'm on a hammock in the shade, I read one that interprets it for me. And when I'm doing my own study, I do one that doesn't help me out. And so it depends what you use it for. Here's, here's what the word kanao, the essence of kanao means. It means to position yourself in a very humble posture. That's why this translation says, made himself of no reputation in verse 7. Made himself of no reputation. Um, if you notice in this verse, if you see this verse, it, it says he humbled himself or made himself with no reputation. And you notice that there are three words that don't take things away from Jesus. They're actually three words that add to Jesus' role. He humbled himself not by getting rid of anything. He humbled himself by taking on additional things the King of Kings and Lord of Lords doesn't have to do. He did not humble himself by subtraction. He humbled himself by addition, by doing more than what the King of Kings and Lord of Lords had to do. Notice this, taking the form of a servant. He emptied himself. He put himself in a humble posture by doing something that kings don't do. Kings get served. And the night before he's crucified for his creation, he takes a basin of water, girds himself with a robe, you know this, and takes a bowl of his creation and kneels down and washes his creation's dirty feet. And says, do this and follow my example. He came to serve, not to be served. He humbled himself by doing extra things by job description he didn't have to do. Now notice this, taking the form of a servant, he humbled himself also by this phrase, coming in the likeness of men. Listen to this beautiful picture of humility. Listen to this. The word coming Sounds like an English word. The ancient word is genao, G-E-N-A-O, where we get the word genealogy. It's the Greek word that means to be born. He humbled himself by being born just like human beings are born. He did not enter the world with some glowing chariot. He did not have this pronouncement of glorious fashion where the entire world heard. He came to earth in such humility that he didn't even have barely room to house him. And he came just like we were born in the humble, natural state of his own creation. Now, would you appease me for a moment? Because there's something I think about whenever I read this part of Philippians 2.7. This moves me. Okay, so if this doesn't move you, just act like it moves you because I get really excited about this. So if it, just be a gift to me, I guess. Next 10 seconds. Whenever I think about Jesus being born just like men are born, I think of these, this truth. If you ever study scripture, there's four chapters in the New Testament that you should really write your term paper about Jesus Christ. It's, it's Hebrews chapter 1, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and Philippians 2. Hebrews 1, John 1, Colossians 1, Philippians 2. Those are the four consummate references to Jesus. You get a full picture. Here's what they teach. John chapter 1 teaches of how God declared it, creation. The Son did it, and the Son literally wrapped himself in flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hebrews chapter 1 uses the most explicit words about Jesus being God. There are no greater Greek adjectives in the entire New Testament than in Hebrews chapter 1 that talk about the amazing truth that he was God when he was on this earth. God the Father, he calls him God the Son. Colossians chapter 1 explains that the moment the Godhead decreed creation, the Son did it, and immediately it answers the question, well, how did he do it? What's his relationship? He literally created it. He didn't wind it up and walk away. The moment the Son created creation, he literally sustains it all. It says, and he is the head of the body and church, and in him all things consist. Literally, the moment before time began, he decreed creation, and that means the Son's job is to literally hold every little millisecond and atom and neutron together. He didn't do it, wind up, walk away. He literally holds it together. So that means, that means, here's, here's, here's the epiphany. That means, if that is the God that holds everything together, that means when Jesus was traveling through the birth canal of his mother, he was holding the world together. When Jesus was asleep on the boat, 
and his disciples say, Jesus, wake up, wake up. There's a storm. Don't you care? Don't you know what's happening? In his humanity, he wipes the sleep out of his eyes. And in his divinity, in two words, he calms the raging storm. The commander of his creation. Glory to God. He humbled himself by coming just like men were born. And it says, in being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He didn't have a glowing aura. He didn't levitate. He walked right up to his creation and looked them square in the eye and taught them and allowed them to say, I know your mother, I know your father, your brothers and sisters. I bounced you on my knee. You're saying you're the Messiah. He walked into synagogues and let his creation go. I don't think you know what you're talking about, Jesus. We'll talk later, maybe. He allowed his creation to pull his beard out. Josephus said on the cross, he didn't even look like the form of a man. He allowed his creation to spat on him and to mock him and say, if you're really the son of God, why don't you get off that cross? And do you recall what he did in the garden? When he was being bound by Malchus and all his disciples are asleep, Peter gets out of his slumber and, and, and he swings his little dagger and he cuts Malchus's ear and he's sitting there and he goes, put that sword away. You live by the sword, you die by the sword. He says, come here, man. And, and literally as he's condemning Peter's action, he literally heals the man that's going to take him to the cross and he goes, don't you know that I could call right now? And he goes, come here, you're good. And don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels right now and get out of here? But how would I fulfill what the Father has sent me here to do? Great humility. Unity in his example. Humility in his life and selflessness. Look at the very last of the verse. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Glorious selflessness. Don't you know I have 12 legions of angels literally on standby? probably within their spirits, wanting to release me from this. But if I don't go to the cross, and I think about myself, where would you be? It's all about Jesus. It has to be about Jesus. Glory to God. If you look at that last phrase, You'll notice that that last phrase in Scripture doesn't need to be there to make the sentence the point. It could have just said he became obedient to the point of death. Okay, if you're curious what kind of death, the death of the cross. And I want you to focus on that word cross. Focus, friend, focus on that word cross. The Greek term is the word staros. In ancient writings, the word staros would never, ever, ever, ever be said in public. It would never be used in formal gatherings. The word staros is way too piercing, way too abrasive. It's a term that brings so much shame and disturbing emotions. It wasn't a vulgar word. It was just a very vivid word that in formal writings, you never see the word staros in literature, ever. You see it in the Bible because the Bible is written in common Greek negotiating Greek, just vernacular, the language that people on the streets would, that's why we see it all through scripture, but in formal rooms and formal gatherings and formal writings, they would avoid that word at all costs because it is just too disturbing. Why? Because in the first century, Rome had a way of telling you we're in charge. Crucifixions, as you well know, were done and literally placed on the streets. Not on some hill, not in a distance. They were literally lining the streets so that every time we would walk by, we would see our countrymen on the crosses and on the star right, and we, it would be Rome's way of saying, don't mess with us. We'd walk by their billboard of this disgusting display of power. And if we were to gather in a formal room just like this and we're in a formal gala and we had to talk about a couple of our countrymen that we saw on the road, we would not say that they're dying on the star ross, we would, we would soften it up. We'd use euphemisms, just like we do in funerals. We, we don't say he died, we say he passed away, he went to glory, because it's too piercing. We would say, he's, he's, our friend was lifted up today. Or he stretched forth his hands. But anything to avoid this word. Do you remember the moment Jesus had to forgive Peter. 
Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. Peter, yes, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Yes. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then it says, now Jesus has to predict the way he's going to die in the future. But his emotions are too stirred in front of his friends. He just got confronted about denying the Lord. So Jesus softens his emotion. Look at John chapter 21. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, Peter, when you were young, you girded yourself and walked wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, Peter, you will stretch forth your hands, my friend. Peter couldn't handle it. 65 AD, history books tell us not the Bible. Peter was captured by Nero and his wife. Peter's torture was twofold. Before the crucifixion, he was forced to watch his own wife be crucified on the cross in front of him. Two days of excruciating pain. Josephus tells us that all Peter said was that he looked up to his wife and said, Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. She expired. They took her off the cross. And when they went to nail him on the cross, he goes, Wait. Crucify me upside down. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. They honored his request. He died that very morning. Jesus expressed the, the sympathy and the empathy for his own disciples. But here's the question. Why is it in Scripture that the majority of the times we talk about Jesus' sacrifice, the Bible does not soften it up? He became obedient unto death, even death of the piercing cross. Colossians 1.20, we was reconciled through the blood of his cross, cross, cross. Why do we read? Why does not the scripture soften it up for our great Lord? And I think I know why. Because throughout the scriptures, the Holy Spirit wanted us to know that the Lord lived such a selfless, humble, and unified life. He loved us so greatly that he said, I am not going to spare any pain any shame, any bad reputation, any embarrassment. I want the world to know that I went to the lowest of the low and I did it to save your soul and I did it to redeem you and bring you into life eternal. I don't need it softened up because I need you to know that I loved you that much. The cross, that's why it is futile for this church or any other church that names the name of Christ to ever divert from proclaiming the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope of salvation and the only peace that this world will ever need. If you name the name of Christ, my pastor, my friend, never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is a power unto God and the salvation. We must be all about Jesus. It is all about Jesus. It must be all about Jesus. It will forever be about Jesus. And I ask you, has your life been all about Jesus? Or has it been all about blank? Has your mind been consumed like mine? Just loving Jesus? relying on Jesus, praising Jesus, or has your mind been consumed with all kinds of things other than Jesus? I ask you today to focus on, Lord, I'm sorry I made my life more about everything else but you. Forgive me, God. If you're here today, Maybe this is just a time where the Lord just takes his word and puts it on your heart exactly where it needs to go. Friend, make your life all about Jesus. Would you bow your head as we think about these things? In the quietness of this moment, I pray that you'll just Use this time to let God do His work in your life. Has your life been consumed with so many other things? And maybe even, to, maybe even this week, you actually question the care of that God. And the Lord is just saying, don't you know I'm holding your world together too? Don't you know I'm holding your world together too? Maybe it's time we just spend some prayer time and just refocus and say, God, forgive me where I've gotten my eyes off you. Lord, I praise you. If you're here today and you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, there will be pastors and caring listeners up front that will be willing to open their Bible and share with you how to become a child of God. Lord, we use this time 
to just let you do your work. Right now, this house is a house of prayer. For anyone listening in, this is time where we just listen to your word and listen to you now speak because we want to leave this house different today. So Lord, this is now your time. Do your perfect work in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Join me standing as we start our response time to listen to him. It's after a service like this, how can we not focus on our need for the Lord Jesus Christ? It's after a service like this where we realize how we compare to him. I think as I even reread the passage that we studied this morning, it, it, was, it was that feeling of, Lord, you are so worthy and I need you so much. If that's you, if after watching this service, you have now acknowledged, I need a savior. I wanna invite you, even in the quietness of this moment, wherever you are, to just pray, Lord, I believe I'm a sinner. I am so sorry for my sin that has hurt you. You are God and perfect. There's no way I can save myself, but I believe you are the sinless son of God who has proven himself by rising again. And I accept you as my savior. Lord, save me right now and he will do it should you really sincerely plead to him to do it. I want to encourage you. I would love to hear of your testimony. The number on the screen, call us, reach out to us. We would love to show you how you can take the next steps in maturing in your faith. And I pray that you will be a passionate Christ follower as we are here too at the church. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to watch this and other Victory Hour presentations on the internet by visiting groveav.tv. Please remember that this program is viewer supported. It's your prayers and offerings that help us meet our airtime expenses. If you would like to help, you can call us at 804-740-8888. Or you can write us at 8701 Ridge Road, Richmond, Virginia, 23229. We hope that you have been encouraged by today's program. Please join us again next week as we gather for worship, for prayer, and for Bible study, live on the Victory Hour.